We can transmit and receive better signals if we change the shape of the antenna we use. But well, why does the shape even matter? And why is a TV satellite dish shaped the way it is? Let's find out. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to the second class in the radio navigation series. Today we're going to be having a look at why antennas are shaped the way they are and also have a quick look at some of the common ones we see when we're flying around. Antennas are designed to transmit and receive the radio waves we learned about in the previous class and depending on their shape and size they can be optimised for different uses. The most basic form of an antenna is a wire with electricity flowing through it. When this happens, an electromagnetic field is generated around the wire and radio signals are just variations in this electromagnetic field that are projected out in all directions if it's an omnidirectional beacon or uh, aerial. The radio wave, which remember is an electromagnetic wave, the same as light or x-rays, can be split into two components that act as variations in the electric field and variations in the magnetic field. These are projected out at the speed of light in a vacuum omnidirectionally, in phase, and perpendicular to each other. So you've got the E for the electric wave, going vertically in this case, in what we call the E field, and the magnetic wave is what we call the H field, and that goes perpendicularly at 90 degrees, so that would be sort of horizontal wave as it goes along. With radio waves, we are generally interested in receiving the electrical part of this wave. The direction of the electrical part of the radio wave defines something called its polarization. In this example, we would say it's vertically polarized because the electric field, the E field, the electric wave is vertical. This means that when we want to receive this signal in another antenna, it's best to have another vertically arranged antenna. If we had a horizontal antenna, we would only be receiving part of the signal because only every so often would we, the wave actually hit the antenna, whereas if it's vertical, the wave is hitting the antenna the whole time. So in summary, you basically want uh, the same polarization as the electric field of the, or the E field of that wave that is being projected. The ideal length of this antenna is half as long as the wavelength. So the ideal length is half of the wavelength lambda. Don't ask me why, some clever physicists will be able to explain, but uh, this can be practical for some signals with short wavelengths, but in reality it can be quite hard to have a receiver that is the ideal size for the signals we use, especially if we have to fly with an antenna on top of the aircraft for example. To give you a quick idea, if we work out the wavelengths for the high frequency band, uh, the high frequency band goes from 3 to 30 megahertz. And if you remember, we calculate the wavelength by dividing the speed of light by that frequency. So in this case, we'll have one that's 3 times 10 to the 6, and another one that's dividing it by uh, 30 times 10 to the 6. And if we work that out, that means that our wavelength for the high frequency band is going to be between 10 meters and 100 meters. So ideally we want half of the wavelength for our antenna. Can you imagine if we had a 50 meter tall antenna sticking out the top of our aircraft as we're flying around? It's not practical. So we can either take that half or we can even take the quarter length of the wavelength and the eighth length, the sixteenth length, all the way down in those fractions. Progressively we would get a worse and worse signal, but sometimes it can be good enough to get away with. Thankfully though, this is not the only way of arranging an antenna and there's some clever solutions around that which we'll have a look at now. The first we're gonna look at is a loop antenna. A loop antenna is used in aircraft as it is very good at detecting the direction a signal is coming from. So when we hook this antenna up to a needle, we can get the needle to point towards the source of the signal and fly towards it or fly away from it. So if we place the loop antenna in line with the radio wave, each side of the loop experiences a different phase of the wave. On this side, we're over on the negative side of our wave, and on this side, we're over on the positive side. Because there's a difference, that means that a voltage will flow and a signal can be generated that can be then used to spin a needle, for example. If the loop was at 90 degrees to the wave, for instance, so say it was standing straight up out the page, there's not gonna be any difference at all between each side of the loop and where this wave of uh, 
where the phase of this wave is experienced. We're both going to experience this bit here because we're standing vertically. There's not going to be any difference, there's not going to be any voltage created, and that means that no needle is going to spin and point us. And in between, we'll get different levels, different points of phase, and that can generate voltages to create signals to send needles in directions. This is the technology that's used in a non-directional beacon system. Uh, the beacon sends out an omnidirectional signal and in the aircraft we have this loop antenna lined up with our aircraft and then we're flying. when we're flying towards the NDB we get a full signal and that arrow points straight ahead using that voltage difference to calculate it and if we fly at an angle to the NDB not flying directly towards it then the voltage difference would not be the same as when we're flying towards it due to the difference in phases. So um, that means that the needle would be deflected towards the NDB and it would tell us, oh, fly left to fly towards that beacon. A parabolic antenna is the same type of antenna you see on the outside of houses for satellite TV. And it's used in those massive space telescopes to detect things light years away. And what happens is the parabolic dish, the circular, well, semicircular dish, reflects the signals back onto the receiver of this antenna, which is at the focus point of the dish. This means that very weak signals traveling in could be focused onto the receiver and amplified in this way. That's why those massive ones are so good at looking into deep, deep space, where it's very weak signals coming from very far away. They're good for this sort of thing, but they're very highly reliant on you pointing at the transmitter of the signal. They're very directional. This is why they work for satellite TV well. They can be pointed at the TV broadcast antenna, which is sending out a signal from very far away and pick up and reflect and amplify the signal to the focus point, meaning that the signal can be picked up from much further away. Broadcast companies no need to invest in antennas all over the place and they can save money. You can also use a parabolic antenna for uh, transmitting a signal, again, in a very directional way. You just basically reverse the process and the transmitter is placed at the focus point sends out the signals towards the dish, which then reflects back this beam of radio waves again in a very directional manner. A phased array antenna is a big group of antennas very precisely arranged so that the phases of the radio waves being sent out are concentrated in one direction. What this means is it can effectively work as a parabolic antenna, as we saw previously, without the need for that big dish. This type of antenna is used commonly along with a parabolic antenna for airport radar systems. You might have seen them spinning around those red and white antennas. Basically what they're firing out, what they're doing is they're firing out a directional signal as they spin and the signal is being um, bounced off of aircraft, picked back up by that parabolic antenna and uh, it's that little green beep on the radar that you've seen in films and stuff like that. This allows air traffic control to see the aircraft on their screens and various information about the flight can be given through the use of something called a transponder, which we'll look at a bit more in a future class. A slotted planar array antenna is a mouthful of a one to say, first of all, but it's a flat antenna with a series of slots in it. These slots are acting as a series of individual antennas and it's quite similar in um, how a phased array antenna works, but the phased array antenna will need to be physically rotated to get a picture of more than just one direction. Whereas with a slotted planar array antenna, you can digitally sweep the beam of radio waves back and forth. Um, with a flat radar, you won't get a full 360 degree sweep, but you can get a good sweep in front of the antenna without having to rotate it, making it cheaper and lighter as you don't need to have any motors or anything spinning this antenna. This is is the type of antenna that is commonly used in aircraft weather radar systems. Basically what you can do is you can sweep the radio waves back and forth in front of the aircraft to detect water droplets. They'll bounce back and be picked up by the antenna in like a receiving. You can switch the mode from transmission to receiving easily as well. So you'll send out, it'll bounce back off of water droplets and you'll get a nice picture generated on your navigation display of what weather is ahead of the aircraft. A helical antenna can produce a circularly polarized radio wave used either omnidirectional, much like the simple length of wire, or in a very directional fired out the end way, which is used for GPS signals. The benefit of a helix is that the same sort of signals can be picked up by a helix antenna as a straight whip antenna, but a lot less length is required. 
Remember the ideal size of a straight antenna is the wavelength of the signal divided by two, it's half the wavelength. Um, whereas a helix uh, antenna, the distance between the coils and the diameter of the coils itself determine the wavelength sensitivity. D that's basically where you don't have to use half the wavelength, it's all about the distance and the thickness of the coils. So you can get a much smaller helix coil antenna for the straight length one that you need. The other mode of operation is used in what they call axial mode. You fire out a signal at the end. It's very directional and that's used exclusively with GPS. With all of those antennas, when they fire out a signal or want to receive one, there is a maximum range essentially limited by the height of the transmitter and the receiver and the curvature of the earth. This is before we take into account returning sky waves that we talked about in the previous class. Uh, we're exclusively talking about line of sight waves or space waves. For example, there's no way a plane on this side of the Earth is going to be able to receive a signal from the transmitter over here because the curvature of the Earth is in the way of that straight line between the two of them. But as we get closer and closer, there's going to be a point where the signal just pops up over the edge. And this is obviously assuming there's no mountains or buildings in the way, hence max theoretical range. So the formula we use for the max theoretical range is 1.23 times the square root of the transmitter height plus the square root of the receiver height. So if we take an example of the transmitter here being at sea level and the aircraft traveling at uh, 30,000 feet, for example, we can calculate the max theoretical range quite easily. All we have to do is 1.23 times the transmitter height, that's going to be zero, square root of zero is zero, times the square root of the receiver height, we'll just do it in uh, feet, so 30,000 feet. If you pop that into your calculator, you'll get something along the lines of 1.23 times 173.2, which comes out as 213 nautical miles. So it's good for calculating a rough range of signals for when you're at a certain altitude.